Welcome back to another episode of the Advocacy Help Desk. I am Brian Fratkin, uh, CEO of Spark Influence. Um, Andy Polk, our typical co-host, is on vacation slash on hiatus slash working way too hard to be able to join us today. Uh, but we do have a very special guest host uh, to join me. I'll introduce him in a second. Um, just a quick background on the Advocacy Help Desk. Thanks again for joining us today and for listening in. We are the Advocacy Podcast uh, and video series. We're basically here to help. We, we are a series of professionals that have been doing this for a long time and answering questions that come in on our website at advocacyhelpdesk.com or in person or by chat or any other way uh, that you want to reach out to us, ask a question, have a challenge, something doesn't seem right, uh, let us know and we'll get a guest on that can talk about it and answer your question in that way. Uh, today, I'm excited about our guest. I'll let Nick introduce him in a second. Um, but we're going to be talking a lot about what happens after a build has uh, what do you do in those different ways? What are the different pieces that you need to put together and how do you announce a passage to your membership and all the other things that go along with it? But to dive right in, uh, my guest host this week is Mr. Nick Desarnum from the Public Affairs Council. Nick, it is good to see you. Uh, I know you just showed us before we started taping the weather in Cambridge, England, where you are, will be 57 degrees and rainy for the next eight days in a row. Yep. Awesome. Um, Fantastic. A lovely thing about England is that once it strikes like October, September, it's going to rain basically until March. And so <laughs> you can't really look at the weather forecast that often. It's going to be, you know, mid fifties and wet. Um, and it, the sun, it's great in the, in the summer because you'll get like um, 18 hours of sunlight, but in the winter it is dark at eight o'clock in the morning and it is dark by two thirty, three o'clock. Uh, so it's really nice, so, you know, depressing. Um, well, you look no worse yeah, for the wear, but it's good to see you, Nick. It's good to see you. It's nice to have these bright Zoom lights on me. Hopefully, that's gonna you know keep me awake and alive. Um, the thanks for for having me on as a as a guest host. I know Andy is really busy right now, um, doing his day to day job, and I'm excited to do this. I work at the Public Affairs Council, um, so similar mission to the Advocacy Help Desk, which made sense for me to be the uh, the, the co host here in the sense that we help advocacy professionals do their job better. We do professional development, those types of things, um, a lot of resources, surveys. We're just releasing our public affairs um, pulse survey, which we actually go out and interview um, a thousand folks online. Morning Consult does the poll for us, and we ask them their opinions on lobbying, and um, we ask them about the election that's coming up, uh, like if they trust the election results. That's getting some news attention right now. So if you're interested in that, check out our website. But I'm really here to introduce and talk to Christopher Masick. Thank you for joining us. Um, I think he's in, the, are you in Atlanta? Uh, yeah, I'm in the hinterlands of the North Georgia, uh, north of Atlanta, yeah. Okay. So we're, we're kind of all, all in different locations, thanks, thanks to the, the power of Zoom. Um, and Chris is the Senior Associate Director of Advocacy at the Alzheimer's Association. Um, and I've been looking at his kind of past um, career and, and you know how you got there. And um, one of the things that I saw was that you were in charge of e-advocacy for the American Society um, or for cancer. Yeah, American, American cancer, cancer Society, Society Action Network. Yep, that's right. Um, I always get that wrong. Um, and and it said that you were in charge of e-advocacy at one point, which sounds like this. I, you know, like old term for like, I don't know, they were printing out emails or something and faxing it in. Um, the so, file of fax advocacy department, sure. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and obviously things have changed since your role there because you've been um, at the association that you are now for almost nine years. So kind of, I'm just kind of curious what kind of got you into the advocacy realm. And, you know, you obviously have done a ton in the nonprofit healthcare space as well. What, what kind of drives you forward? Uh, that's a very open question. So yeah, uh, I, I will say like a lot of folks, um, I, I became the de facto or the accidental uh, advocacy person or actually the, the accidental IT department. So truth be told, uh, years ago, I uh, was selling computers in college at a Best Buy and um, be, you know the the that that wrangled my way into the what is now known as Geek Squad. The oh, it used yeah. to be the Tech Bay at Best Buy, and um, 
through that, uh, just, you know, develop some knowledge of, you know, how to turn on a computer and what a, what a mouse did and those kind of basic skills that um, didn't really exist at some small local nonprofits. And so uh, through that, I uh, essentially, um, as I was continuing on with school, I uh, went into grad school and stumbled into a role working uh, for the American Lung Association, uh, you know, one of their local affiliates uh, around the Atlanta area. And that just kind of blossomed. I started, you know, I was introduced to early tools uh, like Get Active and some of the, the, the you know, the, the tool sets that folks used to use to, you know, for the very early days of uh, sending sort of spam emails to Congress and that, that kind of stuff. And it, it just blossomed from there. You know, the, the fact that I was the person who knew how to hit the power button on the server in the, in the, in the back closet has now turned into an electronic engagement, a communication style role and an advocacy organizing role. Um, and, and of course now I'm with the Alzheimer's Association and um, we have a, an affiliated organization of 501c4 called the Alzheimer's Impact Movement. And uh, yeah, that's where I, I spend my days, uh, you know, still, Still probably spamming a few folks, but uh, a little little more targeted and coordinated these days. A little different than in the past. I love it. I, you know, we, we have a lot of great guests on here. Uh, I know Nick comes, uh, you know, did the Hill route and did the association route. And I actually, uh, it's because of my parents. We talked about this before. They used to work in the government. So, you know, everybody has their own route into this industry. I love the Best Buy angle uh, and the de facto tech support that turns into you know what, uh, this is how people want to work with technology and let's make the messaging work in that way and let's get that, that prospect going. Um, Chris, thank you again for joining us. I always love seeing your face at conferences. Of course, that's now long gone, but when we can. Um, uh, you know, one of the things that I wanna talk about today and, and that you mentioned as we were sort of just chatting was that you're, you're looking at having a bill of yours uh, hopefully come to a vote and hopefully pass uh, in the immediate. And, and so I think the questions and the pieces that I want to build around today is what happens next? What is your game plan for, okay, great. As any advocacy professional will hopefully have happened, their bill passes. Fantastic. What are those next steps? What are those immediate pieces that you're looking to put in place, you know, 24, 48, 72, a week later, et cetera, time frame for, for getting the word out and then getting people to continue to be involved. Thank you messages, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so I think the first thing is to, to, to think about it, kind of frame the, the climate in, in Congress, of course. You know, uh, everyone talks about do nothing Congress is or dysfunction and things like that. But the reality is no. to bring a bill uh, before Congress and get it passed is a monumental endeavor for most organizations. Mm -hmm. um, and it takes, you know, often years. Uh, I've seen, you know, various publications talk about somewhere between, you know, six and 12 years to pass a piece of legislation. I think they landed somewhere around eight on average, you know, that's if it even makes it that far. A lot of bills stall out, die, get swallowed up by other pieces of legislation and so on. And one thing I'm very proud of at the, the Alzheimer's Association is that we have consistently uh, led the charge on pieces of legislation federally. And of course, you know, in many of the states, actually all the states, um, and we have consistently had legislative wins. Uh, we've had regulatory wins as well, but, but you know, passing legislation. So with that comes a few things. Uh, one is we don't want uh, to ever develop a culture where folks assume it's on autopilot, sure. right? Oh yeah, that's just going to happen. We just need to phone it in this year. You know, it's just set the clock. Piece of legislation will pass. Right. Um, that is <laughs> never the case. Uh, the reality is, it takes a lot of work by a lot of people. Um, advocates, uh, federal affairs staff, you know, board members, CEOs, um, and just you know, a whole range of folks to get involved and 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 message. And you guys know this. I mean, this is what we talk about on, on a daily basis. All those folks that play a role. So, when it comes to the passage of a bill, uh, we hope no one is you know, 100% surprised that it passed because we, uh, we try to communicate with folks throughout the process, right? Hey, you know, this, the bill was introduced. Here's how it moved through one committee. Here's how it moved through a chamber, things like that. So whether they're getting text messages from us, whether they're getting emails, uh, they're seeing it in, you know, other newsletters or on social media, 
no one should be surprised when a victory comes, uh, 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 other than the fact that like, you know, it's that happy surprise of, oh, it happened sure. now, um, you know, and of course, there are times when it doesn't pass and we, you know, there's some disappointment. But once we, you know, assuming, and again, I'm knocking on wood right now that, you know, we have a, a bill that's pretty close, um, should this bill pass or should some of our other bills pass, we don't want to just say, yay, that was great and leave it alone. Right. You right. can't do that. It's, right. it's because it's, the, it's an empty victory. It, it would just be sort of a, a moment of cheering and then nothing. Mm -hmm. And um, in the past, I will admit that some of our, you know, maybe not just this organization, but other organizations have done the, hey, the bill passed. Right. And then six months later, you finally get another email about the next issue and there's nothing in between. That's a huge misstep. We just, we, we really don't want to do that. So the first thing is to communicate it out, right? And that's whether you're firing on all cylinders or it's all, you know, targeted messaging just to the people who, you know, have demonstrated they care about that issue. Um, we have to tell somebody that it happened. Right. Um, right. Part of that is, you know, email and like I said, text messages. And so if our bill passes, we intend to, to send those out. Um, but then it, it, just an announcement bill, you know, it's kind of like those old uh, save the date emails that you used to get from folks. Those were worthless yeah. because there's nothing to click. There's nothing to do. It's an empty sort of waste of my inbox. You know, you're, it's a missed opportunity. There has to be something interactive. And so what we uh, as an organization have tended to do is provide a thank you opportunity to the legislators, to the, or, you know, the, the leaders in Congress or in, you know, um, it, it, depending on who it is, a state legislature, but we have, we provide an action taking opportunity where folks can at the very least send an email or tweet their member of Congress and say, you know what, thank you for playing a role in this bill. So, so stepping back one step, um, yeah, yeah. clearly, you know, one important to communicate at all times, right? This is not just a, we have a bill, it passed that's doing it wrong. We really should be talking with our membership about what we're doing on their behalf, et cetera, throughout this whole time. Two, you have to, you, you know, when it does pass, if and when it does pass, right? Not sending a note is horrible. Sending a note without an action is also bad, right? Because then you're just sort of leaving your, you, as you said, I like your term, don't waste an inbox, you know, moments, right? Don't, don't, don't waste that, that time that you have with just, Hey, it passed. Instead, look to do something else with that moment and direct the energy towards something to do. And with that something to do, your first step is saying, let's go and thank those folks that were part of this, that voted in the affirmative or in the negative, whatever it is, to do what we wanted them to do. Let's thank them with the people, you know, with our people. Yeah, and that's not always the case. I mean, the reality is, you know, there, uh, frankly, something passes Congress, there is a next step, you know, the, the, it has to be signed into law by the president or something like that, right? So there could be other opportunities that aren't purely a thank you. Mm -hmm. But one mm -hmm. of them, yeah, one of the more common ones is to set up some thank you opportunity, um, at the very least to legislative champions or co-sponsors of a bill or sponsors, you know, in, initial sponsors of a bill, sure. something like that. Um, there's also, you know, broad-based thank you to all members of Congress. And it, it's really going to depend on um, the dynamics of how the bill passed. Right. You know, did, was it a floor vote? Was there opposition? Or was it a, you know, just a universal a hand raise kind of, uh, you know, uh, kind of thing? So that's, uh, but, but that, the idea that we would send out a message to folks saying, hey, bill passed, dot, 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 pause, pause, pause. It's, it's just months. unfulfilling. We'll talk it's unfulfilling. Yeah, we want to, at the very least, you know, tell them you should go celebrate this and in some way. Um, one way to celebrate is to, you know, convene with other advocates on, you know, on social media and you all share a victory image or a, a similar tweet or something like that. Another is to send a message, you know, to an elected official and say, hey, thanks, you played some role in this. Um, and, you know, we're, we want to acknowledge that. Members of Congress, as you all know, um, Getting thank yous uh, is, I don't want to say it's super rare, but it is by far, it happens you know, far less than receiving criticism or, or, or an ask, right? They, they, they get asked to do a lot of stuff. They get yelled at a lot. But receiving a, a heartfelt thanks from um, a, you know, one of their constituents or an advocate in their area or someone they've even built a relationship with, 
uh, that, you know, it, it, it has an effect. Yeah, and I think, I mean, also just from a pure data kind of geek having been worked on Capitol Hill, you know, members of Congress want to hear from their constituents. And it, for one reason is that it gives them some data on what their constituents care about, right? They're logging all these interactions in um, now, and, you know, and so they want to know, okay, well, this person really cares about healthcare and they understand the issues and they, they thank this. Um, plus some of your advocates may not take action on the, you know, um, hard ask questions, but they will take action on a nicer, you know, um, thank you. But I also always see that Alzheimer's, you guys use your um, Twitter account, um, whether it's AIM or, or your, or your uh, association one, really well to, to, to like put out, you know, members of Congress, their face, you do make like a little like Twitter card for them sometimes and you say thank you. And I always see that recirculated, not just because I follow you um, on Twitter, which is, is a great follow if you're, if you're looking for funny tidbits um i think you're open ck Massic or something like that um but you know really looking at okay how do we thank them publicly which they never get right um no one's tweeting other members of congress with their image on it saying thank you for being a supporter of x it's just not happening that often right to be fair uh it, it you know it, sometimes it's the volume of you know bills that are passing right if not much is coming yeah. out you can't thank them for a ton but the reality is that you know members uh, for whatever the issue is, you know, they, they go to bat in some way, shape or form, right? If it's the drafting of legislation, if it's holding hearings, if, it, if, you know, if it's passage through a committee, if it's some of the, you know, I don't want to call it backroom deals, but if it's very much the, 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 the negotiations that might put a piece of legislation into a, a larger package, all of those things tactically happen. You know, mem members of Congress, despite some public perception, um, there's a, you know, they're doing work, or at the very least, their staff are doing work. And acknowledging the you know the office, I think that's also something that Hill staff can see and go, oh yeah, I, you know, uh, I was the I was the, the the health LA, or I was a person who had a role in that. They you know, while if we're thanking them, you know, the member, we are thanking them. Um, sometimes you can thank the staff directly, but you know, most, most often thanking their boss, it, it rolls, you know, downhill and they, they feel that and, and that helps build relationships, right? That's, that's what it's all about. It's building relationships with and trust, um, with members of Congress, because if you just come in with an ask, um, and you bulldog them to death about an ask, and then you leave them alone and don't acknowledge the work they've done, right. that's, you know, it's the same thing with volunteers, right? I ask them to, to, to click, I ask them to attend, I ask them to make a call and do all these things. And if I don't turn around and say, hey, thanks for the hard work, then what's, you know, it, it's unfulfilling and what's the benefit? Right, yeah, so, that's a great way to put it. That's a great way to put it. Um, I like that. So, so, you know, we talk about these pieces in terms of building trust, building, you know, that, that, that relationship with both the staffers and those folks who have passed it. So. You're sending thank you notes to the people who have made it happen. You're sharing tweets that they can share with their local, uh, you know, with their local constituency and, and thanking the members and the staff. I like that idea too. And I like also the idea of putting their photos on it too. I think a few too many folks just put out a text thank you and it, it doesn't have the same effect or get the same retweets that like a nice image of the legislature and it doesn't take that much more time. Um, what is next after that? I mean, you're then engaging folks with, here's the implementation of that. Are you moving on to the next step while also keeping them? What, do you, what is your messaging three weeks from now after the thank yous have gone out and things are starting to be discussed on how the implementation has gone? Sure, so um, you know, again, if a piece of legislation passes, the, um, after the, the, you know, a thank you period or after it maybe does reach a presidential signature, it's signed into law, all of that stuff uh, plays out. We as an organization um, have, really try to see through the, you know, the, 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 the implementation of, of this legislation. Mm -hmm. um, some legislation is, you know, are things that there may be no formal role for, you know, for state governments or even government agencies to do. But for the most part, uh, you know, when, when legislation passes, something has to follow. There's a product, there's a, there's a, 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 an allocation of money, there, whatever the case may be, we want to see that through to its fulfillment. And so, um, for instance, we had a piece of legislation pass a few years back that created a benefit 
um, that, you know, so, so a, a benefit that uh, individuals getting a diagnosis of Alzheimer's could, um, you know, the, the well, it's a, it's a long discussion, but essentially uh, through Medicare, there, uh, the physicians could provide a care planning service to people when they got a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. And great piece of legislation, it, it put a benefit out into the world, right, right? And it was something, and it actually, to be perfectly honest, that bill didn't even pass. What happened was it was so close to passage that um, CMS, Centers for Medicare and, and Medicaid Services, uh, decided that, you know what, we're just going to do that through a regular, you know, like the regulatory process. We're going to take this good idea and we're just going to make it happen. And so the legislation went through all this, this work, but at the end of the day, it just happened because CMS, you know, sort of implemented that. So there's benefits out there. And all of a sudden we realized that, you know, it's, it exists, but is it being utilized? Mm. And so we actually, you know, so the follow-up was to look at that legislation and to, to figure out, hey, are, are people using this service? If not, why not? And when, when it was discovered that the benefit was underutilized, well, then the follow-up comes. And so it's whether it's another piece of legislation or whether it's working with, you know, regulators uh, to, to better communicate this, all of that follow-up activity has to happen. Now, how does that happen? Does the Alzheimer's Association just go it alone? No, of course not. We, you know, we turn to our advocates, we turn to our champions and, and, and folks and say, hey, you know, this is something that your member of Congress worked on, but now they could play a role in making it better and improving upon that, that bill or improving upon that, that, you know, that regulation. Why don't you reach out and let's, let's open that dialogue again. Let's re-engage. Let's have follow-up meetings. Let's make phone calls. Let's, you know, send the tweets, send the email, all of those things just, you know, it's a, it's this, it's a, I don't want to say an endless cycle, but it is a repeated cycle of action, win, or, you know, or, or, or and then a follow-up action. You can't leave it hanging because good ideas can't be hung out to dry, you know? Listen to that. Listen to that tag. Nick. Bumper stickers. Yeah. You have, you have a question, I can tell. Yeah, it's because I'm like shifting my seat and yeah, making pain looks on my face. Um, I, I'm really curious because you're, you know, you've, you've obviously been doing this for a while and I think your expertise really is in, you know, kind of these large nonprofit organizations that you have a lot of supporters, um, you know, when you compare yourself to some other organizations out there, um, you know, if you're willing to tell us your list size, that'd be great. Um, but, you know, you're obviously doing a ton with data and you have the ability to do that because you have such a large N, right? You have so many users in there. A lot of times folks that we hear like the word data optimization, they have no idea, like that just sounds, you know, absurd, but you know, um, what are some of the things, what are some steps that you, you know, people can easily implement to use their data a little bit more effectively? And I know you've probably talked about this issue at other conferences and stuff and in warmer weather. Well, um, I would say, yeah, curious about first that. off, a lot of the, not just the, you know, the organization, but a lot of the movements that are out there that are getting a lot of attention are actually far smaller in terms of pure membership or at the very least engaged membership mm -hmm. than a lot of folks would believe. You know, you can, I, I have seen groups that have, you know, 20 people that are real go-getters and have worked to build relationships with elected officials you know, make bigger changes than groups that claim they have 5,000, 10,000, 100,000, you know, and more. So it's re not necessarily about pure list size. It's about having the right people in the right role and giving them the right, you know, opportunities or the right, uh, uh, we, we have an ambassador program. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a, a program we set up where you have one person who's a volunteer that has that is tasked with building a relationship with a member of Congress, and we set it up with it's a one to one relationship, right? So uh, uh, that's something we were we are able to do because we have you know a nationwide reach and we have staff in in every state. But it it it's a lot of work to just get those you know 535 folks in place and help them build relationships. But then we also have empowered them to build teams to assist them. We're doing something similar, although a little bit different at the state level. So with all of these folks, we do have capacity. And I, you know, I can't deny that there's a lot of folks working for, uh, you know, for this movement um, or with this movement. But 
it can still be done, um, you know, without having to call upon lists of, you know, millions. Um, I, if, if everyone recalls Google and other organizations a few years back with, you know, the Save the Internet style uh, campaigns, and they were bragging it's about so you know, petitions, right? You know, petitions of 10 million, 12 million you know, signers, and that's great. Those, there are moments for that, and it's fantastic, but I don't think it's realistic for a lot of organizations to routinely do the 12 million petition signer you know, kind of campaign. I also don't think it's necessary. Right. Um, if you're, if you've got people that are willing to build relationships, communicate, you know, repeatedly, things like that, um, you can do it with far fewer. I like that answer. Uh, and, and, to and to Nick's point, Nick, you'd asked about, you know, data optimization. Um, one of the things I can say is paying attention to the data does matter, right? Uh, I have had the experience of being handed the reins to a list that was very big and then just sort of blindly hit send on some generic content. Um, and stuff happened. Uh, it wasn't, you know, it's, it's not, it, you know, it maybe wasn't the most negative experience ever, but there was unsubscribes. There were people saying, why am I getting this? What's going on? They, you know, there, there, there is that. And I, so I do think that um, to optimizing a list starts with simple steps, right? Do these people even, you know, have they opened an email in a certain period of time, right? A year, five years. Um, I, we have had situations where we've inherited, you know, some old data, um, not just at this organization, but some of my other employers. And people are like, yeah, this, this is an Excel file that I've had on my computer for six years. Have fun with it. No, I think it's observing behaviors, observing who opens your messages, who interacts with those messages, how they interact, where they interact those kind of things help you then turn around and serve them up similar opportunities or think, you know, you can, you can guess or you can very accurately try to predict, I think this person will take action on, on you know, this next campaign because of what they've done before, you know? Um, I like that, that a lot, Chris, because you, we're not talking data science here. We're not talking like rocket science here. We're talking simple, straightforward kind of queries and simple things, right? I think, and that gets lost sometimes, right? We have a lot of people who are brilliant in public policy and in other places and then get handed the reins, as you said, and aren't sure what to do. And, and what you're explaining isn't something that's, you know, take the next 10 days and run through your database in 15 different ways, et cetera, et cetera. It's just saying, look, who's taken action in the last six months? Who's opened an email in the last six months? Where are the Venn diagram crossovers there? And let's concentrate on those people to start and build out from there. And I think that that's a really, you know, uh, a simple, smart way to look at it rather than being scared by all of, you know, that, that 6 million record or even 10,000 record Excel spreadsheet, but we can whittle that down pretty quickly to just who's actually listening and who's doing something, who isn't. I, yeah, I think it becomes pretty apparent with it when you look at your data that, you know, there are, there's just, there, there are records that became records for some reason. They were labeled a certain way. There was a data entry error, all of those things. And to assume or, you know, or, or uh, you know, just kind of count the numbers because they look big. Those, I think those days are generally over. Um, you know, there were times when it was purely about go buy a list, rent a list blindly, import it, and then brag that you crossed a certain threshold that was arbitrary to begin with. Again, if I, you know, if, if I go buy a million person list, I'm going to spend a lot of donor dollars or, you know, resources that are limited right now um, and put them into a database. And then I'm going to surprise a lot of people with some messaging they, they did not expect. And I'm going, and I will then see a huge drop off and that list will dwindle and dwindle and dwindle. There's a right way to do it and there's a wrong way to do it. But it, you, like you said, it's not super complicated. Of course we can make it complicated. If you want to know, you know, how many African-American women under the age of 40 who wear size large t-shirt that spent $20 last year on product and did, you know, have a mortgage and blah, 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 all those data points. If there's a logical reason for that and there's messaging and there's content to go with it, do it by all means. That's what marketers do. That's, you know, that's what we do to a degree in the advocacy realm. But sometimes we get way too in the weeds of optimization and we add 80 data points and at the end 
you get down to a list of four and they're still the wrong people. That's, you know, there's, 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 there's sometimes the science or, 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 the, or at least the, the tools go a bit far in that. And it's, it, it it's really re reaches a level of ridiculousness. I agree. Yeah. I think, you know, and, but it sounds really impressive, right? And so if you can tell that to a board or tell that to your boss, they'll leave you alone for another couple of months. Um, <laughs> you know, one of the, the things that I was also thinking about is just, you know, you guys have really passionate advocates, um, people that have obviously, you know, their caregivers or they're affected by this disease. Um, and, and so that's, you know, you're, you're lucky in a sense because people really care about those issues. Um, but how do you kind of convey some of that passion or those stories um, to legislators? Uh, in, a, in a myriad of ways. So some folks, uh, the passion maybe isn't expressed the, the, the nicest or the best way, right? And we never want to tell folks, look, you know, you can't speak ab about this issue. You know, if, if you've been affected by this issue or frankly, any issue, you know, use your voice, go out and do that, right? That's what this country is kind of built upon. When it comes to our organization, what we try to do is help them optimize or get better at the delivery, right? So whether that's just providing a simple platform for them to do it, you know, they, they're, people are like, well, I don't, I don't know how to contact my member of Congress. We can give them email addresses. We can send them to a, a, a site that, you know, routes the message for them. We can push them to social channels that the member, you know, is on and say, hey, you know, take action here, share your story here versus maybe another, you know, place where that member isn't engaged. There's a big difference between saying, hey, we need an Instagram presence and then realizing that Senator is not on Instagram. You know, that, that, that you, you don't just share stories for the sake of sharing stories. They need to come with something they need to be which and usually that something is an ask and a, a you know sort of a, a tailored approach so one of the uh and you all may laugh at how simple this is but and you've probably heard it a thousand times but one of the simplest ways of describing it is when we talk to advocates about sharing their story um one of the many you know things that we get to is think feel do right make someone think about the issue provide something that makes them feel or have a visceral reaction when you're, when you're you know, telling them about the issue and then give them something to do. And so when you're sharing a story, whether you're recording a video selfie and you're uploading it to you know, TikTok, when you're um, tweeting, when you are sending an email or you're writing a letter to the editor, all of the various tactics that are out there, um, that's a very simple approach, but that's one way to go about it that we train to, which is think, feel, do. Um, there are other variations of that. You guys have heard them all, but um, I, I will say we never want to tell someone not to share their story, but we certainly want to help them share it more effectively and, and tactics like that help them do that. I like that. I, 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 you know, it's a simple kind of pieces like that that really get us, you know, break things out. Again, like we talked about data simplicity a second ago, um, things of that sort, which is just don't just blindly put a story out there, but at least give it three simple pieces of information that will get somebody to do something um, and that we can measure them as well, right? And then we can figure out if that worked or not and then do something else in the future. I, I think that that's a great piece. Yeah, if a tree falls in the, in the forest, you can have the greatest story, but if no one hears it, no one sees it. If it's you know, TLDR, right? Too long, I didn't read it, right? Any of those things, you're losing the effectiveness of it. And that's one of the things that, um, you know, it, it can be frustrating sometimes because I'm, I'm actually someone who likes long form journalism. I like that article that takes me a half hour to get through, you know, and is very detailed, all right? I I'm love not an Axios secret subscriber right here, okay. <laughs> yeah, but, but that is, but that's, I don't want to say becoming more of a rarity in this day and age. Folks want the 20 second, 30 second sound bite. They want the, the YouTube video. So my personal preferences for a lot of detail or at least a more narrative approach cannot bias what I'm putting out there and what I'm asking advocates to put out there. That's going to be effective. Members of Congress and or their staff do not always, and in fact, rarely have time to sit through a 30 minute, you know, detailed thing. But if you give them a quick soundbite, the elevator pitch, the optimized story, you know, that's going to serve their needs and yours. 
wrap things up um, on my part. You know, one of the things that I would suggest and how I learned is we have 750 member organizations at the council, right? They're all on different issues. They're all on different topics. They would never agree. Um, but one of the cool things that I get to do is kind of be like a student and I learn from each of them and, and hopefully take some of that knowledge and, and give it back to them, to our full membership. I, I think, you know, you guys, um, whether it's the ALZ impact movement or, 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 you know, your association in general, always does great work. So I, I always suggest people sign up for an email list, right? Like you're not a closed organization. You can go and take action. Um, you can go and follow them on Twitter, uh, those types of things. It will help you come up idea with ideas themselves or, you know, kind of steal from the innovation. Um, and so uh, I think I always point people towards organizations like yours to, to do that and say, hey, just see what they're doing. Even though you're in a, your company, you know, you're a corporate grassroots manager or you're, you know, in a, you know you're in the, the tech industry, you're not even close to a, to a healthcare nonprofit. You can still learn some things and, and, and take it away. Yeah. Um, yeah, a lot of, I mean, I'll, I'll be frank, a lot of our best ideas are not us looking at healthcare nonprofits or even nonprofits. There are some things we see out there and we just go, that looks cool, that's bright and shiny, that's neat. But we're also not the type of organization that is that has to be on the bleeding edge of technology, right? If I am sending advocates out into the world wearing VR headsets and they're running into trees and things like that, that's not necessarily always accomplishing my goal, right? So um, we look at what's effective. And, you know, if carrier pigeons were effective, we'd use it. You know, it, it, they're not, by the way, I just <laughs> put that out there. At least not. But, oh, well, you know, things come back in circle, we'll, we'll see. But, um, but you know, I, it, again, it doesn't have to be on the bleeding edge of tech. It just has to be, you know, solid, effective. And then, like we said earlier about the stories, it has to be good content. Um, we borrow ideas and we get our ideas from a variety of sources, for-profit, non-profit, you know, foundations. Um, and, and if it's a good idea, it deserves to, to live on. Yeah. And I, I've always loved that about, obviously, the Public Affairs Council events, et cetera, where you know, a lot of it is the community aspect of it, which is what are others doing and how can I learn from it? And Nick, that's a great idea of if you really want to learn from it, look to the organizations that are doing it well or that you think are doing it well and sign up for their emails, sign up for their tweets and follow along with the messaging. And then, you know, one of the great things too is, is look at what for-profit companies are doing, look at what corporations are doing. Some of their ideas of how they do acquisition and getting people in the door are things that we can do. And we always say advocacy is just selling by a different name, right? So, Think through how you can talk about your issues in a way that gets people involved and gets them interested. I love it. Um, yeah, let's I have a waste all their money on, on those fancy things that are not effective, but then you can see and judge from yourself, like, wow, they did this entire campaign and, you know, it didn't work out. Okay, what, you know, didn't work. Perfect example is like Starbucks. They did this GOTV effort a couple of years ago where they put like a sticker on coffee cups and it was this whole where they changed the coffee cup to be like a voter thing. And then they put like a long URL on it. And like, there was like 45 signups from it. Um, you know, like no one registered to vote because, through that process. Cause who's looking at their coffee, then going to their computer, then remembering that, you know what I mean? It's just not something how people, you know, so you can say like, okay, well, is this clickable? Is this something that, you know, people are actually going to go and take action on? There's always some learnings that you can take from, Big companies who are, are fine with wasting some of their marketing budget. Uh, th I think there was a, a wireless carrier a few years ago that did some sort of video contest. I'm not going to name who. Um, and it was, you know, nationally advertised. They dropped big money on some ad buys. And I, I, I don't remember exactly the number, but when they, that was at a conference and they sort of reported the participation level and it was, you know, dozens of people. Um, and, and, and so, that's one of those things that, you know, uh, it, it, now if done right, dozens of people, like I said earlier, can be very effective. That campaign, however, was not. So it's not always about bright and shiny. It's about what's effective. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, I love that to end on today. Uh, Chris, I have a page full of notes here talking about, I think the main theme here is, is simplicity is don't overthink it. Um, you know, take the steps you need, put together that playbook for if your bill passes, here are the simple things you can do, but make sure that you're following up with folks. In data optimization, don't overthink it to start. If you're starting from scratch here, look for the easy answers of who's opening and who's acting, and then build from there and segment as you want to. And when it comes to, you know, stories and conveying passion, 
it's about optimizing that message. It's about keeping it simple. It's not the hour long discussion about X, Y, and Z. It's how can I make this into something that's that, that, you know, your, your, your think, feel, do concept of just how do I make it into something very straightforward, very simple that gets people to act and, and, and do what I want them to do, but, but is in a way that's just easy and simple and, and straightforward. So um, I, I love it, Chris. This is, I could, you know, we could do this for another hour and a half, uh, frankly. I didn't even talk about, you know, what happens if your build fails. So we'll get to that next time. Um, but uh, this was wonderful. Uh, Nick, thank you for joining us once again as my co-host today. Um, always please visit pack.org and their biggest page on the site, pack.org slash jobs. If you're looking for something, always a great page to look at. Chris, as we've discussed, uh, follow the man on Twitter, but then also do sign up for their emails and, and do sign up for their tweets because they do a great job of engaging folks with content that matters and a lot of things you can steal, right? A lot of great things you can steal. So on that, thank you again, gentlemen, for joining me. Uh, another great episode of the Advocacy Help Desk. Please do follow us at advocacyhelpdesk.com on YouTube, on iTunes, on Spotify. We're everywhere where you want to be or where you are. Uh, and in the meantime, as Andy Polk would say, keep advocating.